perspective. Britain's election fallout. What it means for Brexit and Canada. It was a year ago this week that Britons voted to leave the European Union. And tomorrow, formal Brexit negotiations will begin. Amid the horror of the apartment fire in London, the continuing concerns about terror and security, and in the aftermath of a divisive election, a weakened but defiant Theresa May is clinging to power, vowing to cobble together a coalition to continue to govern. This will allow us to come together as a country and channel our energies towards a successful Brexit deal that works for everyone in this country, securing a new partnership with the EU which guarantees our long-term prosperity. That's what people voted for last June. That's what we will deliver. Now let's get to work. For all her determination, May's political authority is significantly diminished at home and abroad. That said, the EU is also pushing to get on with the business of Brexit. The clock is ticking. Michel Barnier is the EU's chief Brexit negotiator. And in these negotiations, which will be, in any case, difficult, I think that the EU should always remain cool-headed and solution-oriented. We should put all our efforts towards reaching a deal. This is a spirit in which I, with the trust of the institutions and all member states, will continue working. On the program this week, we're going to take a look at the Brexit negotiations from Europe's perspective and how that may have changed given the UK election results. We'll also take a closer look at the election itself and what the outcome reveals. But we begin on the ground in Brussels with Ryan Heath, a senior EU correspondent at Politico and the writer of the blog Brussels Playbook. From the perspective of the European Union, how does the British election affect the Brexit negotiations, if at all? Well, what's very clear is that Theresa May had a very rough campaign. And what it means is that everyone in Brussels now suspects she might not be the Prime Minister in a few months or a couple of years' time. So they're all wondering, when the Brits turn up at the negotiating table on Monday, do they know what they want? And will it still be what they want in a few months' time? So it injects a huge new level of uncertainty into the negotiations. Um, who do they actually then think they're negotiating with? If they're not certain that it is actually Theresa May, you know, who, do, who do the Europeans think they're going to be negotiating with? Well, I think in literal terms, they realize it's with Theresa May's government. But what they're hoping is that some kind of majority forms either within her government or from the Houses of Parliament in Britain for a softer form of Brexit, a kind of half Brexit, where the UK does stay inside the EU's internal single market or some kind of other arrangement. They're hoping that Theresa May doesn't eject uh, the UK entirely from this EU ecosystem. So, so a softer Brexit would be the EU preference. Why? Yes. Well, it's more of the status quo. What Theresa May has previously been suggesting is a real jolt to the EU system. It suggests that it's easy to get out of the EU system and that Britain will be just fine without the EU. And the EU itself would obviously prefer to, to have a little love still come from, from London. And they would obviously not want to change too many of their own systems. And they want to be able to argue to the rest of the world that there's still a huge trading block and a huge power. And so the closer they can keep the UK to them, the more they're able to make that argument. What's at stake for the EU here? Well, the EU's uh, credibility on the world stage is at stake a little bit, and also their own forward momentum. So at one level, Brexit allows the EU to really argue that it has to stay united and sort out its own house. It needs to finish building this grand project that it started 60 years ago. So Brexit helps them do that. But also what it shows is how easily they can be hobbled. It shows that they don't have a lot of hard power in this world. They're going to lose one of their they're big players. So it's going to be very difficult for them to demonstrate to the Chinas, to the United States of the world, that the EU has to be at that top table. I mean, I know they've got a negotiating team, but among the member states of the European Union, where do you look for the leadership on this and perhaps where the pressure might come from in terms of the details of, of what that Brexit might look like? Well, for most of this Brexit process, we've looked to Angela Merkel. She's kind of the mother of Europe, where not a lot happens unless Angela Merkel signs off on it or initiates it. I think that dynamic changes a little bit with the election of Emmanuel Macron in France. He clearly is the, 
the powerful, uh, attention-grabbing new kid on the block. And he clearly wants his share of the financial services action that might leave Britain once Brexit occurs. He wants to put his own stamp on the European Union. But we shouldn't forget others, like the Prime Minister of Spain, Mariano Rajoy. He was leading a caretaker government. It was a mess in Spain until a few months ago. And uh, now that is changing. They're back in the, the thick of the action. Uh, negotiations like this obviously don't uh, happen quickly necessarily. And Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator for the EU, has talked about how difficult it is going to be. Do you really think it's going to be that fraught? Uh, yes, because the divorce is the easy part, and we're already seeing difficulties in these divorce discussions. So Britain will have to settle up its bill. It's got some legal obligations, and they don't go away just because they decide to leave the EU. There are four million people who live outside their own national uh, home inside of Europe, and that goes in both directions. And they want to know what's the deal for their family after Britain leaves the EU. Will they be able to, to stay in the country that they're in? Will their pensions be affected? And so on. And that's the easy part. The UK will have to somehow renegotiate 750 international agreements once it leaves the EU if it chooses not to stay inside things like the single market, chooses not to be part of the EU's trade policy. So that's massively complicated, um, never mind setting up um, how it operates on its own. It's kind of outsourced its own regulation making for about 40 years now. So those skills don't return overnight. You, you really have to pedal furiously under the water just to look like you're standing still. The negotiations actually begin in earnest uh, this week. What are you going to be watching for? Personally, I'm going to be making sure or really keeping an eye on whether the UK is having to give ground on things like the order and the sequencing of the negotiations. At the moment, they've insisted that they have to talk about the future trade relationship before they agree to hand over any cash to the EU. And the EU is really digging its heels in, saying that's no way to move forward. You have to build A and B before you can get to C. So if the UK gives ground on that sort of front, that's a sign that they're not in a very strong position. But also, this isn't just a zero-sum game. The two parties are going to have to demonstrate that they, they understand that they need to work together to find common ground. It, it sounds almost like a cliche, but this isn't a competition. It's not one side has to win and the other side has to lose. And so if they can't kind of find that positive dynamic from the beginning, we might be headed to a lose-lose situation. So I'm going to be looking for those tonal things and the nuances rather than some massive headline that comes out of the talks. Thanks so much for your insight on this. A pleasure. And that's our program for this week and this season. Just before we leave you, a final thought from Politico's Ryan Heath in Brussels. We were chatting just before our interview, and he brought up Prime Minister Trudeau and offered a lighthearted look at his political impact. With Ryan's permission, we thought you'd enjoy it too. We rate um, EU leaders on a scale of one to Justin Trudeau of how much love they're getting from the world. <laughs> You can watch any of our programs at cpac.ca, and we'd like to hear from you. You can reach us at, on Facebook and Twitter or by email at perspective at cpac.ca. From all of us at CPAC, thanks for watching. I'm Allison Smith.